hidden in the heartland. It was absolutely by chance. Um, I have a degree in radio television communications from uh, Purdue University. Um, started my career as a local weekend weatherman. Um, then I went into production where I was doing show choirs, weddings, um, a myriad of that, but I was really looking into doing documentaries and historically found that we had burial mounds here in Northeast Indiana, which I didn't think anyone knew about. I had a double major also in history and I didn't know anything about them. So the plan was go out, photograph maybe seven or eight burial mounds, make a short documentary on ancient Northeast Indiana and go from there. Well, in doing that, I started finding giant skeletons, even locally around here. Well, it just so happens that two blocks down the street from where we're shooting right now is our public library that has the second largest genealogical library in the country, only second to Salt Lake City. So it means that I have access to every county in America's um, local histories. So as I began to expand out, I found more mounds, I found more giants. And 12 years later, after uh, visiting 700 mound and earthwork sites, I had my travel guide. And it took me that long too, to not just have a list of giants, but to figure out where they came from. And that was a lot of work. And everything led me back to Babylon. And that was the Nephilim Chronicles, Fallen Angels in the Ohio Valley and then the subsequent mound guide that went with that. So there's 900 reports. And the largest that I documented were about nine and a half feet. And so while you may have some 18 feet and that, that's ridiculous, those, those are not true. But nine and a half feet, and I still had 900 of those. Well, in biblical times, we had tribes that were giants, um, the Amorites, um, which is probably the most notable, notable and a tribe that has a historical record, were giants, um, according to the Bible. And then we have the Zanzuman and the Emin, and we have some others in there. But if we're gonna make this road from Babylon, and we know that the Amorite and the counted you know, giant tribe came over here, then we should find giants, and we do. So it just seems to be historically relevant that you would have large skeletons here. And you'll see on YouTube or Facebook and somebody will show a footprint that's, you know, three feet, which would make like a 20 foot, 30 foot person. And, and those people never existed. So I always say they weren't fee fi fo fum giants. They were just really big people. So yeah, nine and a half foot. And you know, the nine and a half footers that I have was in the Muskegon County um, history from the 1800s. And it was five people that signed a document saying these were uncovered, we saw them measured, this is how big they were. So, and then, you know, when you get in these historical records like the county histories, these were sold to the most prominent people in the county. So there was no room for, you know, crazy stories. It would have only made it into that book if in fact it was verified. So yeah, there's a lot of seven footers, seven and a half footers, you know, as you go to eight and nine foot, there's less and less. But we're, what we're generally talking about is a large race of people. I know in uh, my limited knowledge of the Book of Mormon, um, I understand that the Jaredites were large. So there is some precedent for um, large people in the Book of Mormon, along with the forts that they said that they were building at the time. And then we have these large skeletons adjacent to, or in burial pits next to the forts. So that story um, is relevant. Grave Creek is in Moundsville, West Virginia, and that's the largest mound. Did you know that at one time that there was a museum where you went in and saw the giant skeleton from Grave Creek? I do have an interesting anecdote because I was just at Grave Creek last month. And um, 
the curator was upstairs and they were redoing the thing. We said, well, we came all this way to get photographs of the Back Creek Stone or, or the, or the um, Gray Creek Stone. He goes, well, we've, we've put that away. Like, put it away. Like, well, what do you have up there? Well, we just have a photograph of it. I'm like, all right. He's like, well, we just didn't think that, you know, that was pertinent to the site, you know, to have this Hebrew writing, you know, on this. Like, all right. I'm like, well, tell us what you know about the museum that used to be cut into this mound and people would go inside of it. He goes, I don't really don't know anything about that. I like, never heard of it. Like, oh, I've heard of it, but we I don't have any I don't have any documentation on it. Like, All right. You know, usual archaeologists dummy up, don't tell you anything. So we're on our way out and there's a display of photographs of Grave Creek through the ages. They have a photograph of the mound with the entryway going into this museum. And then there was a lithograph that must have appeared in Harper's Weekly or something of people standing in the museum and then upright is this giant skeleton. Well, archaeoastronomy is constructing these earthworks to register both lunar, solar, and stellar events. Um, the circle and octagon at Newark is laid out to get all the minimum, maximum moon set that happens over an 18 year period. Um, the hinge is aligned to the May 1st sunrise. Um, we have other hinges, uh, specifically in Indiana here, that are aligned to summer solstice sunrise, um, equinox sunrise, keeping in mind that that is what Stonehenge is aligned to, is summer solstice sunrise. Um, we have some other things that are aligned to Stellar, um, the rising of Fromhold and some of the other big stars. So yeah, there is a, a, a definite correlation between you know, the sky and then what they place on um, the Earth as far as their earthwork construction to align to these events. Well, they had to um, know these alignments, they had to study these alignments, and it would have probably been within their religious canon as well. So it would have been of importance in their religion that would have you know, brought these people together at these earthwork complexes at these designated times of the lunar and solar events. So it's my belief that if we're going to extrapolate this to the Book of Mormon, I believe that the Jaredites and then followed by the Nephites, um, that southern tier of the Great Lakes is where they lived. I believe there was a battle. There's evidence we have at Niagara, the neck of Niagara, 3,000 bodies in a mass grave. And I have mass graves going all the way across Pennsylvania and New York. I have round earthworks over there. Not the geometric, even though there are some square geometric earthworks scattered all the way from lower Michigan all the way into New York, perfect squares, but a lot, most of the earthworks are round type, more of what you would think of as a fortification. But there's also mass graves all through that line, which is indication of battles. Now in Southern Ohio, we have no indication ever of any kind of battle. There's no mass graves but you get up into that southern tier and there's many. And so if this battle was to take place, that's where it happened. And that's where I believe the Book of Mormon story is located. Well, there is the narrow neck and I would believe that is Niagara. And adjacent to that being, you know, earthworks and also these mass graves that if you were going to invade from Canada, that's probably where you would come through. Now there is the Walla Mullum, um, the book of the Lenny Lenape, and they say that they were bottled up in Canada, wanted to come south, said that there were towns and cities, which I think they're talking about Southern Ohio, and they came across. Well, that would be the most likely 
spot where they would come across without having to cross the St. Lawrence Seaway at any given point. And so I think that is probably was the great battle. And I think it was a running battle all along that southern tier. And that's why we're finding all these mass graves all along uh, northern Pennsylvania, northern New York, all along the uh, southern tier of those lakes. I've always found the Book of Mormon interesting because I thought it corroborated my story. So while I'm not a Mormon scholar, I know enough to go like, you know, we're all on the same page here and we may call things different. So I may say Amorite, you may say Jaredite, and, but we're all kind of on the same page. We're all kind of seeking the same truth. And that's what all this is about. Hidden in the Heartland.